It's summer. While most people are sunbathing and reading their beach reads, you are plugged in and ready to get fierce with some seafaring gals. Pirates have always been glamorized in every area of entertainment. Just the mention of them brings images to our minds. They are history's favorite bad guys. But as we're about to discuss, there were a few fearsome women as well. We'll also delve into the most famous legend in Pirate's Tavern in history, which you can still visit today. So, settle in. Imagine you're on a beach somewhere, toes in the sand, eyes on the rolling waves. Get comfortable. You're about to meet some powerful ladies. I'm Vanessa K. Eccles, and this is Fabled. Shh, do you hear it? We leaned our ears toward Lucian, as if he was going to tell us a grand secret. The bell rang in the distance, a warning to all civil folk to avoid River Street. But we didn't need a sound to tell us of the dangers there. We'd heard the rumors, debauchery, drunkenness, and the like. Sailors are notoriously wretched. The midnight bell, yes, Anne answered him, brushing her blonde locks away from her face. It's not just a warning for us, you know, he said through an emerging grin. What do you mean? she asked, one brow raised and leaning even closer, still hoping to learn the secret. Even at seventeen, she had the curiosity of a child when it came to stories. She and I still shared a love of lore and fables, despite my being two years older. It lets the haints know it's okay to come out. It's their hours. Lucian contorted his hands in the candlelight, creating a shadow man on the wall. Anne pressed her fingers to her lips, as if she were surprised, hiding a playful smile. Lucian continued, Y'all know there are lots of ghosts in Savannah. I don't have to tell you. I recently heard of one that's most especially intriguing. True story. Swear it on my mother's grave. Must we result to swearing? Anne scalded, sending an accusatory glance at Lucian, letting him know he should know better. My apologies, ma'am. Lucian tugged at his vest nervously. I found it humorous listening to the two of them, she younger than he, but with a regal, motherly tone, and he who walked and talked as if his youth still had a firm grasp on him. Well, on with it. I told him, not willing to let him off the hook. It'd been a long few days. Anne and I needed the respite only a good story could offer. Lucian perked up, happy to finish. Sometime at night, if you're brave enough, Samantha, he whispered, smirking at me and continued. You should walk down River Street, past the taverns and shipyard until you reach the edge of the road where the shadows stretch as far as the eyes can see. There, resting beneath the arms of a tall oak, is a ghost who can tell your future. His words flowed from his lips like a professional storyteller. Now I've heard it all, a future-telling ghost, I sassed. As I stood at the window watching the quiet park, I thought about the violinist who played there every day, for the two years we've lived here. I'd never spoken to him, but I had come to expect him, welcome his somber music as it drifted in the morning air. The bench was empty now, but I could almost see him there and hear the notes as he carefully moved his bow across the strings. He almost made me believe in ghosts, even live ones. I'm telling y'all the truth, honest, swe- Lucian covered his mouth to keep Anne's forbidden word from slipping through his lips. She gave him another look of disappointment. 
Marcus, my cousin, has seen him, and I'll be damned if he didn't tell me something that already came to fruition. Anne huffed at his language, which made me smile. The ghost told him something that already happened? Yes. And what was it? I asked. He told him that he'd marry Margaret, and not even a month later he did. Marcus had been courting Margaret for months, and they were engaged for three of those months. I could have told him that fortune. Anne's voice sounded even more matriarchal, with a slight edge and a hint of unmistakable sarcasm. I laughed. This definitely made Lucian's story even more outlandish and likely untrue. You're going to have to do better than that, I told him, working a braid down my long brown hair. You didn't let me finish, he said, sitting up taller in his seat and leaning toward Anne, who had slouched a bit, already suspecting there was no juicy secret in this tale. The haint told him that not only will he marry Margaret, but they would have a child ten months later, and it would be a little boy. He shrugged his shoulders and pointed his broad nose in the air, as if he were proud of himself. In his mind, he'd finally given us the information that'd convince us. Margaret hasn't had her child yet, Anne told him, proving to him that he had still lost us. I know, but if she has a boy, we'll know the haint was right. Lucian's face slacked when he realized he'd failed us with this grand story of his. I almost felt sorry for him. He tried, at least. And what's this ghost's name? I asked, still trying to seem interested. Neff. Marcus and I are thinking it's short for nefarious. Wicked, right? His smile reemerged. What does he look like? Anne asked, having decided to still play along too. Before he could answer, she coughed into her white linen handkerchief. She wiped her mouth, folded the evidence of her sickness in three bins, and hid it beneath a lightly balled fist in her lap. I bit my lip, wholly taken out of the story. Our reality crushed us, like we'd been hit with a savanna gray brick. Lucian and I exchanged worried glances. Marcus says Neff has a scruffy beard, wears nothing but trousers and an undershirt, no shoes even, barefooted. Can you imagine on those cobbled streets? Lucian asked. How very odd, Anne remarked, bright blue eyes twinkling in the candlelight and bringing her thin hand to her temple. Perhaps he lost them at sea. He probably wasn't buried with any shoes. Lucian said, scrunching his face as if he'd just uncovered the mystery. They'd slip back into the story without effort. I, on the other hand, couldn't seem to take my eyes off the window, the black savannah night. Our family was haunted by something much more terrifying than ghosts. Heavy steps trotted down the stairs. Lucian and Anne's voices fell silent. We all stared at the doorway, expectantly. What are you all still doing awake? Father rubbed his eyes. Standing there in his white night clothes, sweat stains around the collar, hair thinning from what I suspected to be lack of nourishment and stress. He looked almost feeble, much less substantial than the father I had before all this started before the cursed Georgian heat had nearly crushed him. Savannah is killing us. We were just listening to another of Lucian's stories. He tells such delicious tall tales, Anne told him in a soft voice and a side glance to Lucian. Lucian, boy, why are you still here? Father asked. I went to him, pressed my hand reassuringly on his shoulder. Anne needed a story, father. At this, his eyes and guard fell away, telling me he understood. 
He'd do anything for Anne. We all would. I'm sorry, sir, Lucian began, fumbling with his hat. He stood, gave a polite nod, and headed for the door. Father held out his hand in an effort to stop Lucian. No, no, it's quite all right. Lucian glanced at me as if he were asking for my thoughts. I shook my head no. We could all use some rest. Just the same, sir. It's getting late. I'll stop by again tomorrow. Miss Anne, Miss Samantha, good night. He said, putting on his hat and quickly darting out the door. Father and I both watched Anne, who had slipped into another coughing spell. I suppose it's time for me to retire for the night. I'm suddenly feeling exhausted, she said, dabbing the edges of her mouth with her soled lace handkerchief. Good night, my darling, father said as he kissed her forehead. As soon as we heard her soft footsteps in the closing of the bedroom door above us, we both took a seat on the sofa. I don't know what else to do, Sam. He rubbed his calloused hands down his aging face. You've done all you can, I told him, placing my hand on his back. I don't want her to die. A wild look took over his face, and he suddenly seemed terrified. I know, I whispered. I couldn't remember a life without Anne, and I didn't want to. She was not just my only sister, but she was also the best friend I could have ever hoped for. No, we didn't always see eye to eye. We were very different, but she was all I had. She made this family special, and I couldn't help but wonder how utterly miserable and ordinary we'd be without her. How painful the world would be without her. Get some rest, Papa. After a long minute, he hobbled up the stairs, and I found myself alone in the room with nothing but my thoughts. I returned to the window and glanced out at the darkening sky and wondered if anything Lucian had said was real. I wanted so desperately to know what the future held for our family, and it almost seemed worth any consequence to find out. After all, what could possibly be lost? The ghost had been right about Marcus. I'd known Marcus my whole life and knew he didn't have a lying bone in him. And if he really believed this ghost was telling him his fortune, then maybe there's something to it. Probably not, but what if there was? I traced my memories of the past few months. Papa's red face, swollen hands, and all his early nights to bed. Working this hard would kill him, and I couldn't risk losing them both. I couldn't sit by and do nothing any longer. I had to try. I tiptoed upstairs, snagged my brother Garrett's trousers, an overshirt, and a cloak. He and his wife moved to Boston years ago. He certainly wouldn't miss them. Glancing in the floor-length mirror, wearing my brother's garments, I realized how thin I'd become. My brown hair had grown dull, and dark rings circled my blue eyes. Anne's illness had taken its toll on us all. I snuck out of the house, careful to close the door softly. I couldn't risk getting caught. I knew what I was doing was a huge risk. The bell wasn't there for nothing. Those streets are dangerous after dark. No one would recognize me as a woman in these clothes, and I would stay hidden in the shadows. I'd be home before midnight, and no one would ever know I'd left. If this goes well, and somehow the ghost could tell me if my sister would live or die from her sickness, then maybe I could move on with my life. I'd been crippled by the not knowing. It was slowly draining the life from us. It's the unknown that's the worst. Savannah had a different feel at night than it did during the day. It was glorious during daylight, with the flowers in full bloom and the street bustling with the movement of families and workers, everyone cheerful. But at night, the streets were naked, stripped down to its barest form. 
only the shadows lurked. I crept through the park all the way to the end of the street. Two turns until I reached Bay Street. Walking down the cobbled ramp to River Street, I couldn't help but realize why I'd never came down here at night, and rarely even during the day. I knew I was being utterly reckless, but curiosity and desperation had gotten the best of me. As I approached the Sailor District, the noise caught me off guard, taverns booming with laughter and bar fights spilling into the lane. The roads were filled with drunken men and the occasional half-dressed woman. It was a shock to my eyes. I'd heard all the stories, all the rumors, but being a well-bred southern lady, I hadn't seen this side of my city before. I had never wanted to. I tucked into my cloak, kept it pulled close to my face, and hoped no one would notice the truth hiding behind the layers. I tried to keep myself hidden away, out of anyone's sight, but the random drifter caught my gaze. I walked as fast as I could, down the cobbled path, past all the noise and debaucherers, keeping my focus on the mission. Find the ghost. Within minutes, I found myself at the edge of the sprawling oak. Its roots spread like fingers across the gravel. It looked ancient, but more than that, it seemed terrifying. The Spanish moss swung in the breeze, and the darkness of the limbs overshadowing me served as a reminder that this was no place for a woman. This was no place for me. A surge of fear grew in my stomach and caught in my throat. It felt like an ominous warning. I turned to walk away, abandoned all of this as silliness, a desperate girl's last resort. But something moved behind me. It was as if eyes were staring into the back of my neck. The hairs rose, one last chance to run. I inched around, stubborn curiosity always getting the best of me. The ghost stared back at me. Off so fast? The being asked. Completely shocked, I couldn't respond. He was precisely as Lucian had described, tall, dark, simply dressed and barefooted. He held a handkerchief in his hand, blood red. He looked as plain as I did, but there was a hint of something different, as if he'd stepped out of a different era and bled into ours, if only but temporarily. If Lucian hadn't described him, I would have probably thought he was just another person on the docks. You look as though you've seen a ghost, Neff added with a smile. I hear you can tell the future. I took a deep breath and forced myself to ask what I was there for, what I had risked coming to this side of hell for. I can tell a lot of things. For starters, you shouldn't be here. His faint smile quickly turned into something more serious. His thin lips set in a straight line. My sister is sick, I started to say. I know your sister is sick, and that your family is in dire straits financially. You still shouldn't be here, he told me again. Please, tell me if she'll live, and if she won't, I still need to know. Perhaps it'll help me prepare to let go. Maybe it'll help my family too. A sudden gust of wind rushed past us, as if it knew something was wrong. My last warning. My father would kill me if he knew I was standing here, peering into the occult. However, the need to know what would happen to my sister was deep and unrelenting. I couldn't go one more day in the agony of the unknown. Here, he said, wrapping his handkerchief around my eyes. He twirled me around, tying it tightly behind my head. His large palms squeezed my shoulders tightly. You will see great fortune and good health all your days. You soon will embark on an adventure that will enrich you in every way. Peace washed over me like a baptism. 
A moment of silence passed between us. Is that really true? I asked and began to turn to face him, but he stopped me. At first I thought he was going to remove the blindfold, but he didn't. Instead, his fingers clasped around my mouth. Instinctively, I tried to scream. His chest pressed against my back. Hot breath on my ear, he said. Don't do anything foolish. My heart raced, and my breath caught in my throat as he held his hand threateningly around my throat after removing the handkerchief. What do you want from me? I asked, using the deepest voice I could muster, knowing now that this was not the ghost I'd met under the tree. I caught the man's eyes dark and severe, like he wouldn't hesitate to hurt me if I pushed him. He'd surely kill me if he had to without giving my life, family, or sister another thought. My voice quivered. I don't have anything or know anything. I won't be of any use to you. I can assure you of that. Just let me go. His jaw flinched, sweat glistening in the moonlight. He ran his free hand through his dark curls. That's not an option, he said just above a whisper. I scanned the street, looking for the ghost, but he was nowhere to be found. The man took my arm and began dragging me farther down Whipper Street. His fingers dug deep into my arm, and just as we approached the narrow, rocky stairs leading up to Bay Street, I pulled hard, hoping to gain my freedom. I had rather take my chances with the mayhem down the street. My flesh tore under his nails as I managed to break free. I ran until my legs had a mind of their own, rushing away as if my life depended on it. And it did. My heart thudded in my ears when suddenly something crashed into me. I felt my body fall forward, fast, too fast to catch myself. I hit the ground, flesh and bone against cobblestone, crushing under my captor's weight. It took him a few excruciating seconds to pull off of me. I rolled over, pulling my bleeding hands and arms from the stone. I met the sharpened tip of his blade. I warned you. There's no choice here. Come with me or die. His voice didn't shake at all. Nothing about him trembled. His cold darkness was unmistakable. He had made me a promise, and the consequences of calling his bluff would no doubt be high. He pulled me to my feet. I readjusted my cloak, still hoping to protect my real identity for as long as possible. This time his grip was unbearable, sealing my fate. I shuddered under his strength. The unknown hung like the ghostly moon, casting shadows on everything familiar, whispering a grim promise, reminded me that none of my tomorrows would ever be the same. He never looked back, but I couldn't help stealing glance after glance of the long, quiet Bay Street behind us. Two right turns and one left. That's all it would take to get home. What would Papa do with both daughters gone? I'd surely put him into an early grave. Guilt flooded my heart and tears welled in my eyes as we approached the dark woods that surrounded the city. Vines crept ominously up the trees, promising to choke out their lives, reminding me how serious my circumstances were. A bustling noise boomed from the tavern, one of the most notorious places in town. The pirate's house, once home to the city's horticulturist, was now nothing but grounds for the worst seeds the world had to offer. Did pirates really frequent the great southern beauty that is Savannah? They most certainly did. We cannot delve into the history of the pirate's house without first discussing the settlement of Savannah. General James Edward Oglethorpe and other colonists arrived from England in 1733. If you know where things are in Savannah, 
The city hall on Bull and Bay Street is actually where they came ashore. Way before Oglethorpe ever saw what would become Savannah, he had already laid out the city's plans. He wanted to build the city around 22 squares in a grid formation. They all weren't developed, but you can get a good idea of what he'd hoped by walking the squares today. Beautifully lined squares filled with oaks and Spanish moss, row houses and amazing architecture can still be enjoyed. In 1733, General Oglethorpe set aside 10 acres for a public agricultural garden. He used the Chelsea Botanical Garden in London as a model. Oglethorpe hoped to produce wine, silk, and peaches, and of course, cotton. In 1734, the Herb House was built and is believed to be the oldest standing structure in Georgia. It was home and office to the city's gardener. The bricks used to construct the Herb House was manufactured there in Savannah, the infamous Savannah Gray Bricks. Savannah thrived and grew and quickly became a booming seaport town. And in 1753, the garden became a residential area and the inn and tavern were built. That's where the legend really begins. Many people talked about the tunnels that were under the tavern that led to the Savannah River, tunnels that were used by pirates that stole a man away from the city. The most famous legend about the pirates of the tavern in Savannah was that of a local police officer who stopped by the tavern for a drink and woke up on a ship headed toward China. It wasn't until two years later that he finally made it home. I imagine he had quite a story to tell. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Let's pause and hear a promo for another awesome podcast. Hello, and welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, and I'm Canadian Girl. Do you like adventures, myths, legends, and learning about some of Canada's greatest moments in history? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Join me every two weeks as we travel around Canada, exploring things like mermaids, giants, lost gold mines, and we even stop once in a while to observe historical events and people. Come on over to the channel and join the crew by hitting that subscribe button today. You don't want to miss out on our next adventure. It's the legends that surround the pirate's house that inspired Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. In the book, he talks about a pirate named Captain John Flint. Captain Flint, like all good pirates, had stolen a lot of treasure and buried it on a deserted island. He supposedly died in Savannah, in the pirate's house, from drinking too much, and his treasure map was given to Billy Bones. And that's where the adventure begins. Stevenson was said to be inspired by a trip to the inn and tavern. Early editions can be found in the treasure room of the Pirate's House today. The Pirate's House is now a restaurant and is a fun, family-friendly dining experience. But its past is much more scandalous. The tavern was a place full of criminals and people who had tawdry pasts. It certainly wasn't a place for ladies, as I explore in the Buccaneer Bell. The Pirate's House has new legends attached to it now. If you go on a ghost tour in Savannah, you're likely to hear about the undead that still haunt the building, staff, and guests. People have reported seamen watching them, and when they turn to look, the figure disappears into nothing. Footsteps click-clack after hours. Heavy boots move along the wide planked floorboards. People have said they see figures through the wavy glass windows when the restaurant is closed. People have even claimed to run into Captain John Flint, who supposedly died on the grounds. Of course, Treasure Island is entirely fictional, right? Another tie to piracy along the Savannah coast is Blackbeard Island, which reportedly served as a resting place for ships ran by the infamous British pirate Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard. With over 5,000 acres, there's also rumors of buried treasure. In the early 18th century, Blackbeard raided and plundered Spanish ships, amassing a treasure. 
He's been described as tall, dark, a dominating and terrifying presence with a braided black beard. The name of the island can be traced as far back as 1760. Blackbeard claimed that no one but the devil and himself knew where he buried the treasure, but with the maze of inlets, coves, and swamp, it's likely still on his favorite island. Now it's a national wildlife preserve owned by the government. One has to wonder why. <laughs> Though we often think of piracy as a man's game, it turns out there were some pretty famous female pirates. Anne Bonny is amongst them. She was the illegitimate daughter of a prestigious Irish attorney. Being illegitimate, her father had her dress as a boy and work as his law clerk. She later moved to America and married a sailor in 1718. The couple traveled to New Providence in the Bahamas, which was a known pirate island. There she fell for Calico Jack Rackham, a buccaneer in the Caribbean. She was no princess. Perhaps it was her upbringing or the fact that she never saw herself as a lady, but she was a ruthless force. Once, when a man tried to make a move on her, she nearly beat him to death. She was a rum-drinking, mouth-swearing, cutlass-building woman. And she was friends with another famous female pirate, Mary Reed. Mary Reed also grew up under the guise of a boy. She spent her time pretending to be her dead half-brother so that her mother could scam his grandmother out of money. She went by the name of Mark Reed and went on to work traditional male jobs. She became a pirate in the late 1710s because she was on a boat that was attacked by pirates. She sort of fell into the profession, one could say. She soon joined Calico Jack Rackham's crew, and that's when she met Anne Bonny. Anne and Mary were a fearsome crew. They led a series of raids in the summer of 1720, but Jack's group was caught. The men were executed, and Bonny and Reed were pregnant, which saved their lives. Mary, however, later died with fever in prison. And then there was Grace O'Malley, who actually led a fleet of 20 ships. She was another force to be reckoned with, or so the British monarchy found. O'Malley kept her hair short and was born into an Irish clan. By the 1560s, she meant she was going to continue her family's legacy. She plundered English and Spanish ships and also attacked rival clans. She, too, is described as ruthless. One legend even claims that she did battle at sea only a day after having a baby. She spent her time behind bars as well. The British authorities were always on her heels, and by the time she was 63 years old, she had found herself in trouble with the British authorities again. She appealed directly to Queen Elizabeth I. She portrayed herself as a sad, tired woman and asked Elizabeth to return her ships and her captured sons. She promised to return and retire in peace. But of course, Our Lady Buccaneer did not do so. Historical records show that she continued pirating until her death. These are just a few of the famous female pirates throughout history. I've always wondered how women like these found their way into such a harsh environment which is partially why I wrote the Buccaneer Bell. When pressed and without other options, people are capable of doing what they never believed they could. If your options were, one, your sister dies, or two, you become a pirate, as in the case in my book, it's not hard to see how even the most ladylike woman may find her inner fierce. Fabled was produced by me, Vanessa K. Eccles, with music by Kevin McLeod. If you'd like to hear the full story of the Buccaneer Bell, visit fabledcollective.com. There you can find links to the digital, print, and audiobook. Want to support the show? With as little as a dollar a month, your generous support helps produce the Fabled podcast, books, and audiobooks. I cannot do this without my beloved patrons, and I'm forever grateful for their kindness. 
Be sure to say hello on social media at Fable Collective. Until next time, thank you for listening.